those walls that we called sin and shame They were like prisons that we couldn't escape But He came and He died and He rose Those walls are rubble now Remember those giants we called death and grave they were like mountains that stood in our way But He came and He died and He rose Those giants are dead now This is our God, this is who He is He loves us This is our God, this is what He does He saves us He bore the cross that fear that took our breath away Faith so weak that we could barely pray But He heard every word, every whisper Now those altars in the wilderness Tell the story of His faithfulness Never once
Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest ray, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ Why I sing your praise will 
Lord Jesus, we come. I want to thank you, Lord Jesus, for being here, God, in this place, Lord God, as your children cry out to you, Lord God, as your children sing their praises to their King. That your spirit is present here, Lord Jesus. This isn't performance, God. This isn't about the music, God. This is about us pouring out our, our praise to you, God. And it's about who you are, Lord Jesus. Not about us, Lord God. We don't worship each other, Lord Jesus, God, because we're all the same. We're all sinners in need of grace. But you are altogether different from us, God. Your word says that in Psalm 50. It says, did you think that I was altogether like you? That I did the same things that you did? That I thought the same ways that you thought? You are outside of us, God, Lord Jesus. But you choose to live within us, God. It's, it's mind-blowing. God, be glorified in this place, Lord Jesus, as you're word goes out, God, as your heart is reflected in your word, God, and you want to teach your children, God, by the power of your spirit. Teach us now, Lord Jesus, we need you. We love you. We praise you. We want to honor you, God. It's in your precious, holy, and righteous name that we pray. Amen. Woo! God is good. So I, uh, one announcement I purposely let out because I let out, left out because I wanted uh, it to be on the YouTube uh, here that uh, this Wednesday night we, we started Genesis. Was it, it was great Wednesday night, Genesis. Uh, we're, I'm so excited about getting, jumping into that and what a great kickoff we had to that book. But um, this coming Wednesday night is our church family meeting. That's why I was saying everybody come out Wednesday night. You're going to find out more about the direction we're going in this year and uh, the church facility and breaking ground and, and finding out how we can all be involved in that. And uh, we'll be talking about how God moved uh, this last year in 2023. And, and so uh, neat opportunity to come out Wednesday night. I want to encourage you to come out and, uh, and be involved. Um, you know, uh, a growing church, what it has going for it is people that are really plugged in, people that are involved. They're not, and I'm not saying you guys are, but a bunch of pew sitters, so to speak. Um, you know, I, I mean, you know, when you're, when you're in the middle of doing something like this, uh, moving forward and, and talking about breaking ground and building an 18,000 square foot facility, um, I don't know if you guys know that how big of a stretch that really is for us as a church and for the board, for you, for our community. I, I say that because um, where we are at, it, it, I want everybody to understand that the thing that's before the Lord. The right thing to do would be to, to leave 5,000 square feet that we, that, we, that we lease here for an astronomical amount. I don't even want to talk to you about that. Come on Wednesday night, you'll find out more. And... Um, uh, and move into 10,000 square feet, and then double again in size, and then, then go build. That's, that's the thing that generally, that's the right direction. We can't do that. Well, because Maricopa doesn't have anything to lease. Everybody's in a school, right? Or they have a, an old little bitty church building that's been around since uh, who knows when, since this was a dust bowl. So, um, uh, so this is the thing. I mean, even the, the, uh, the two banks that we've been dealing with, they've sent guys out, one from Minnesota and one from Southern California, and they looked around and said, everything, Roger, you said over the phone was true. They, you, you don't have an option. Like, you have to build. And so uh, that's, a big, that's a big stretch. It's like we're jumping from, we're trying to cut corners. We're going from first base to third base. Um, and God's doing it. it but that's the... That's the thing that's before us. So come out Wednesday night. We're going to talk more about where we're going and how God's, how we're looking for God to do that. But it takes, it takes everybody's, really everybody's involvement. And I'm not just talking, you know, monetary, but uh, everybody's heart and everybody's prayers. So uh, just neat stuff. So this morning we are going through the book of Acts and uh, I'm drinking some nice hot lemon tea, getting my voice all tuned in, <laughs> spilling it on me. 
Somebody call my wife, tell her to bring another shirt. <laughs> um, and here, uh, as we go through the book of Acts, here, here in, we're going to pick up in Acts 6, uh, verse 8, so you can open your Bibles there. This is where the persecution happens. I mean, you know, it has been, I mean, the Spirit of God falls on the apostles and the disciples, and man, the church just is on fire, and we all want to be a part of that. I mean, thousands at a time are getting saved, and, and then now all of a sudden, <laughs> persecution arises, and, and it's going to get real because now they're a force to re be reckoned with. The, the religious leaders... They, 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 they've been trying to silence the apostles, and, and they can't. And the more they try, the more it grows. Well, well, as we've seen, because of growth, they had to elect seven men full of the Spirit and God and the character of God and appoint these to do more ministry. And don't think that that was just the only area that they were appointing. I know your Bible doesn't say it, but I'm sure they were appointing godly men and women to do all kinds of ministry. So the, the church has really taken form its walls are going up, its roof is forming, so to speak. And the religious leaders, they are full of questions and they want to debate. And the world wants to do that. The world wants to suck you in, you know, uh, liberalism and, and all this wants to suck you in. And they want you to give an answer. And all they're trying to do is argue. So be careful not to get sucked into a debate. Not that Stephen made a mistake here by getting sucked into a debate. But uh, actually his debate... It's quite profound. I think that his message, what we have recorded, the part of his message we have recorded here in Acts 7 is actually uh, so powerful. I, I believe that it, it led, it, it, it paved a road, it, or, or at least it cleared the brush to pave a road towards the Gentiles coming into the faith. And, and so it, it's super important to see this, but, but in the light of persecution, we need to know that the church is expected to stand up and have a voice. I mean, really, Stephen, in his message, is calling these religious leaders again. And really, you, it's important to understand, for these guys, these religious leaders, humanism and, and uh, really idolatry had crept into their hearts. They, they saw the temple, and they saw Moses, and they saw the law, and it was all it was was idolatry. They were worshiping the temple and not the God of the temple. They are worshiping the law, but not the God of the law. And it's so bad, it's so destructive, and it's in the church, not, not, I'm not just us, but I'm in the church, the big C, you know, at large. People get so caught up into it, and Yesterday, Doug and I and my wife, we had the privilege of going to Calvary Chapel, Queen Creek for the funeral of Pastor Charlie Johnson. Been a pastor for many years. He, he passed away. And uh, yeah, remember him from the men's retreat. Yeah, so um, he's taught here uh, several times. Um, but when Pastor Jim Remington got up to do the message, he preached the gospel. And, and he reminded, look, apart from Christ... We're all sinners. And, and really, Stephen's calling these religious leaders on the carpet and saying, y -y -y you think you got it all figured out, but you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And, and nobody likes to be called a sinner. <laughs> when I heard the gospel for the first time, I said, oh, I want to stand. Wait a minute, pal. I'm not that bad. You know, you know, you're you're a sinner and going to hell. Well, hold on, I've done some bad things, but I don't deserve like eternal prison. You know, but we need to hear it. It's a part of the gospel we can't leave out. And and though at times it feels like you know, you like gnash your teeth and charge at the preacher. <laughs> you know, don't say that about me. Uh, it needs to be said. Ultimately, that's where we're at. So persecution comes in. It's the beginning. And so let's pick up Acts 6, starting in verse 8, just to, to verse 15 first. And Stephen, now, he, full of faith and power. I love this. He did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Syrians, they were from Alexandria, and those from 
Cecilia, and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. And then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. Not the council again. All through the six chapters, we keep hearing of this council. And they also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against his holy place and uh, in the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place, speaking of the temple, and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. He hadn't even begun to speak yet, and the countenance of God was upon him. Stephen, full of faith, Power. He did all these great wonders and signs amongst the people. We see that the great wonders and signs were not just limited to the apostles, but Stephen, one of the men who were chosen by the church body to wait tables, was full of faith and power. Sometimes we think that faith and power is limited to those with titles, as many think or would like to have you think. But that's not the case. There was a point when, with the apostles that this same council perceived that the, the apostles were untrained men who had been with Jesus. In other words, they weren't trained in the synagogue like, like this council was. And they were rebuking the council. And the same thing here goes. A man with a degree or a doctorate in theology does not possess faith and power greater than any other person empowered by God. Because power is not of ourselves. It's not within ourselves. It's of God. Now it's great to get higher education, get learning. I'm not knocking that. The Bible says to show yourself learned and studied and approved of God. You should know what you're talking about. But I love this. Faith and power through Stephen. A deacon, a guy waiting on tables, wiping them down, handing food to widows, making sure they had their needs, probably bending over and tying their shoes when they couldn't reach their shoes. Loving man, a servant. But then there arose a dispute with Stephen, probably because of the type of man he was, the kind of servant he was. Not just the signs and powers, the answered prayers that he prayed over these widows. and it, it became known. Just the power and presence of God in his life and how he served the Lord and served others became known. And so we see that these from the synagogue of the freedmen, they show up and they dispute, they're debating with Stephen. A spirit-filled servant of God. A man with his mind on God finds himself in a spirited conversation with Jewish leaders who had come from the synagogue. Again, there is good reason to believe that these men were, that were questioning Stephen were also part of the same sect or same group as Saul of Tarsus, who would later be Paul. They came from the same region. Now, it's important in Jerusalem... Uh, like with these Hellenist Jews, these, these Grecian, you know, in, in Acts 6, the first part of Acts 6, these Grecian widows that weren't getting their needs met, there were, there were over 400 synagogues in Jerusalem alone at this time. And they were made up of different people that came from different regions, right? So, so this probably was the, 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 the synagogue that Saul of Tarsus was rightly connected to and part of the Sanhedrin, and part of the council of Pharisee of Pharisees. These guys probably thought that they were really something. But Stephen is about ready to give them a history lesson. Most believe that Saul of Tarsus was probably <clears throat> here for this, due to the fact that in chapter 7, verse, I think, 22, we'll see that it's actually Stephen holding their coats as they, as they stone Stephen to death. Interesting as we move through. 
In verse 11 through 14, notice here the opposition. The enemy doesn't fight fair, does he? The world doesn't fight fair. They secretly induced men. And really, what they did was they, they coerced, they, they, they paid, they manipulated in some way men to say that Stephen is speaking blasphemous words against Moses he, and, uh, and, and so all this, and he's stirring up people. He, uh, he's bearing false witness. All of these accusations, now this is the same council, once again, that the apostles have stood before in the early part of Acts. This is the same council that Jesus stood before. They're doing the same thing they did to Jesus, to Stephen. Don't think for a minute. Jesus said, look, they crucified me, they hated me, they crucified me. They're going to hate you, they're going to crucify you. We see the same thing happening here. They bring the same accusations against Stephen. Why? Because he is an awesome man of God. Same accusations. They, do, they use the same techniques against Stephen. Unable to hold their own in an argument against Stephen. For them, the only logical and wise decision was let's get some men to lie. <laughs> That's what they do. Again, this is how the world works today. If they can't win an argument or they are unsuccessful in pushing their opinions upon you, they will then resort to destroying your character. Be careful. You might ask. Again, uh, I, 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 and I kind of mentioned this, how did Luke know some of these facts of what these men were saying and all of this, that they, they stirred up and they, they, they induced men to say these things? Well, remember, uh, Luke and Paul, Saul, who later became Paul, was a close, they were, Luke was a close traveling companion. We'll see that in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the rest of the book of Acts, all the way through it. And so they had plenty of time, hours, endless hours, for Luke and Paul to tell Luke exactly what really went down here. So in other words, Luke got his information firsthand from the chief persecutor of the church at this time. That would have been Saul of Tarsus. Not only that, but Saul, before again his conversion, was heavily involved with this synagogue of the freedmen. They stirred up the people. The opponents of Stephen could do nothing against <clears throat> the followers of Jesus until it got popular They didn't want opinion to get on their side. They didn't want the church, the Christians, the followers of Christ to get the upper hand. Previously, persecution against the apostles had been limited because popular opinion was with them. And now they had to stop this. Again, like with Jesus, it was okay, but now we've got to stop him. The enemy doesn't want the church to grow. The enemy doesn't want a, a, another effective Christian church in the city of Maricopa. Don't think that, that everybody's for this. Largely, they're not, probably. They stirred up people. They say, we've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against what? This holy place, the law, Jesus of Nazareth. He's saying, we'll destroy the temple. Look, all of this, these were accusations against Stephen, many of which are the same false accusations that uh, they brought against Jesus. twisting his words, Stephen would have never taught against Moses and God. But Stephen did teach that Jesus was greater than Moses and equal with God as Messiah. Stephen would have never spoke blasphemous words against his holy place, that is the temple. But he wasn't going to allow it to become an idol as many Jewish people of that day it had become. Therefore, they twisted his words. 
Pastors get their words twisted the same way because people don't want to hear the truth. Verse 15 of this, And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly here at Stephen, saw his face as the face of an angel. Stephen, on trial, before the highest religious court in the area, and as they examined him, being examined by educated, powerful men, this is what Paul told Luke. You want to know the truth? As we were just bringing all this blasphemous lies against this man, when we looked at him, we saw the glory of God. We saw the presence of Jesus in his face. That's the truth. That is the truth. See, the truth is Stephen's face reflected the perfect peace and confidence of one that knows and trusts in God. His face had the same reflected glory that Moses had when he was intimately involved with God on Mount Sinai. Exodus 34, 29. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the, uh, and the, and the two tablets <clears throat> of the testimony, that's the, that's the law, were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. Don't think for a minute Stephen knew, just like Moses. Moses comes down from the mountain and goes, hey guys, you got these cat tubs. And they're like, whoa, where have you been? Did you touch some, uh, 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 um, some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of something up on the mountain? Was, you know, you're glowing, you know. Uranium or something? <laughs> That's what I was looking for. <laughs> Did you touch uranium or something? You're like, you know, uh, um, but, but just the difference, he's glowing. The glory of God was recognizable on Moses' face. It was recognizable on Stephen's face when you choose to stand for God. I mean, stand for God in the midst of opposition. God will be present in you, and he'll be recognizable to the world in you, even if it costs you everything. Even if you don't know it, it's happening. The face of an angel. It also means that Stephen was standing there and he wasn't afraid of dying. He wasn't afraid of these men. That's powerful. Now, let's jump back here. Let's look at seven. <clears throat> We're going to pull seven apart. It's a long chapter, but I, I want to just um, give you a, a solid overview of this chapter. But let's go ahead and read it <clears throat> as we do. And so, uh, then the high priest said, so he gives them, uh, uh, are these things so? It starts off here with the, with the high priest of this council, probably Caiaphas again, giving him an opportunity to speak. So Stephen speaks up. <clears throat> Brethren and fathers, words of respect, listen. And he starts in. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Macedonia, before he dwelt in Haran, and said to him, Oh, get out of your country, and from your relatives, and come to a land that I will show you. <clears throat> and then he, came, <clears throat> excuse me, then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no children, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way, that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them for 400 years, right, Egypt. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God. And after that, they will come out and serve me in this place. And then he gave him a covenant. God gave Abram a covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs. Here we are, the 12 patriarchs. And the 12 patriarchs, verse 9, became envious of Joseph. That's their younger brother. Many of you might know the Old Testament story. Into Egypt, they, they sold him into Egypt, into slavery. But God was with him. 
and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now a famine and great trouble came all uh, over all the land of Egypt and Canaan. Natural scriptures tell us the whole world was under famine at the time. And our fathers found no substance. But when Jacob heard <clears throat> that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers first. That's the patriarchs. His boys, Joseph's sons, brothers, excuse me. And the second time, Joseph was made known to his brothers. The first time when he, they came, he kept silent. They didn't recognize him. He didn't rec but the second time he made himself known is what Stephen is preaching here. And Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. They found favor because of Joseph. They found deliverance because of Joseph. They really found salvation because of Joseph. Verse 14, then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt and he died, he and his fa our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham brought for, bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, uh, Hamor the father of Shechem. Verse 17. But when the time of the uh, promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. Now he's back to Joseph. Till another king arose, he didn't know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. At this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up, in, the father's, in, um, in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him, uh, brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. So he, he leaves his palace, he goes out, and, and <clears throat> he starts to kind of hang and mingle with the Israelites there in Egypt. He felt drawn to them in some way. Verse 24. And seeing one of them suffering wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. Remember, he killed him. He, that's what sent him fleeing into the wilderness. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand. But they did not. Now, what had not happened yet? This was an inclination, a, a feeling, an emotion that was rising up in Moses. Uh, it was from God, but not fully yet from God yet. So he's acting prematurely before God actually says, Moses, I want you to go get my people out of Egypt, right? From a burning bush. He's acting prematurely, he takes matters into his own hands. Who hasn't done that before? Okay, so he, he's slain them. All uh, right. So, where am I at? 25. For he supposed that his brethren would, uh, would have understood. 26. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. You're like family. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor uh, wrong pushed him away. Moses, get away from us, saying, Who made you ruler and a, and a judge over us? Do you want to kill us as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Uh-oh. And then, um, <clears throat> you know, he's going to put it on Facebook and Twitter. and <clears throat> 29. And then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian. That's the backside of the desert. Where he had two sons. He found his wife. He had two boys. And then 40 years had passed. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. And when Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, uh, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, take off your hand, sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. Ho holy ground. He's in the middle of the desert 
There's a burning bush, and God says it's holy ground. Keep all this in mind as we wrap this up. I'll be making my points. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their groanings and have come down to deliver them, and now come, uh, uh, and now come I will send you to Egypt. Moses is by this time at the end of himself. This Moses whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of an angel who appeared to him in the the bush. He brought them out after he had sworn, shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt. You know all the plagues, all the stuff. God's working through Moses and his staff and Aaron. And in the Red Sea and in the wilderness, 40 years. Takes them right into the wilderness between the Red Sea and crossing the Jordan. Verse 37 this is, what, this is that Moses who said to, your, to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brother, and him you shall hear. This is he who, <clears throat> who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses, who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. And here he's quoting Amos and 2 Kings uh, 21.3 and Amos 5.25-27. Did you offer me uh, slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness? Well, no. Um, you offered them to this golden calf, right? O house of Israel, you also, look up, uh, you also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your God, a reform, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. More judgment. Our fathers, <clears throat> he's quoting scripture here now, uh, he just quoted scripture, now 44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. God told him how to make the, the tabernacle there which our fathers having received it in turn also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands as the prophet says, heaven is my, foot, is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, that is Jesus, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. (sighs) Drum roll. Anyway, 54. And when they had heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth, But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. 
And then, they, <clears throat> and then he kneeled down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, notice that Stephen, whew, thank you for all that reading. That took like 20 minutes. <laughs> it's easy to do, congested and all that. Anyway, notice Stephen doesn't cry out. Jesus, help me, help me, stop him, Jesus. He never does that. Nor does Stephen say, uh, you know, starts rebuking them, telling them, you're going to hell if you stone me, and, the, you, know, you know, all this, you know, starts fighting. I love this. This is so powerful. So let's, let's take a look here. Now, chapter 7, a couple points. This is the longest recorded message in the book of Acts that we just read which reveals the importance that Luke attached to it. It's important that we read it and understand it. Remember, Stephen was a Grecian Jew, and his life, ministry, and death prepared the way for the gospel to reach outside of the area of Judaism. Stephen's powerful history lesson here just angered these religious men to the point of violence, and yet Stephen does not attempt to vindicate himself not one time. You always know when God, when a man or woman's full of the Spirit, they're not going to vindicate themselves. Now, verses 1 through 8, we have the promise to Abraham. Stephen's reminding them of the promise to Abraham. In, in 9 through 16, Joseph's journey to Egypt is being reminded. In verses 17 through 43, the deliverance of Moses. In, in uh, the deliverance through Moses. In 44 through 46, the building of the tabernacle of testimony. That is the temporary temple, basically, that was God told Moses to erect, had the people erect while they were still in the 40 years. So as they traveled, it went with them. And that's where they would meet, Moses would go in and meet with God, the tabernacle of meeting. 47 through 50, we have the construction of the temple. Now, Stephen is purposely using each one of these to draw a point. A, here, the point that Stephen is making first is the blessings of God are not limited to the land of Israel, nor are they limited to the temple. And remember, all of this for these religious men had become cultish. They'd taken on a form of idolatry. Our land, our temple, our law, our, you right? And it wasn't no longer the God of our land, the God who, who gave us this land. That's what's wrong with America. God gave us this land. But now, it's become like idolatry, even for many Christians. Instead of just all we can do is give back what God's given to us, like anything, as an act of worship. We're off the rails because we haven't done that. They were off the rails because they hadn't done that. Same with the temple. He's really just stomping all over their theology now, as whacked as it was. You think, and he'll talk more about it, yeah, God had you erect a temple, but listen, God's not, uh, God wasn't just confined to the tabernacle of meeting as they would set it up and break it down and travel and set it up and break it down and travel, and they end up dragging it right into the into the promised land with them until Solomon built a temple. But God's not just confined to that temple. That's like thinking that God's just confined right here. Now the gospel says that God, who's everywhere, right? I mean, he's, right? he's in you and I. By faith, God lives in me. We become the temple of God. It's the gospel. And he knew that. But see, that, this is the thing. Jesus presented himself as the temple of God. Ah, <laughs> throw stones at him, okay? So it's a gospel message that they're really hating on. It made them mad. These things had lost their proper place or meaning and all became idolatry. Reminder one that Stephen was making here is that Israel's patriarchs and leaders were called and blessed outside of the land. 
when he brought up Abraham and he brings up Moses and how God worked in their lives, how God worked in Moses, and I mean, where, where was Moses uh, when, he, when he called him? On the backside of the desert, all alone with a wife, a couple kids, a father-in-law, some sheep, a burning bush. Who was in the bush? Whose voice? It was God's. He's reminding them of all these points. Abraham was called while in Macedonia and given the promise before he, even, uh, before he ever lived in, in Haran. He, he really never, Abraham never really made it. Abraham wasn't fully obedient. And he's going, neither were you. Joseph was blessed and, and found favor with Pharaoh. Why? Because God's presence was with him outside the land. God's presence was with him even when his own brothers meant evil and harm against him. Joseph was a picture of a, ty a type of Christ, a type of Savior for the nation of Israel. He was a picture of Jesus. Oh, they're losing their mind. They understand exactly what Stephen is preaching here. And regarding Moses, Moses was called of God to deliver Israel while in Midian. In fact, Stephen even points out that, he, that God had given him two sons while on the backside of the desert in Midian. Another reminder that Stephen is making, and that is the giving of the law took place outside of the land. The tabernacle of meeting was given, erected in the wilderness and dragged into the promised land. And in verse 49, Stephen reminds these religious men that if God has, uh, 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 if God has said, <clears throat> and he's, well, you know what, he said this, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Uh, the land the, the, was just not limited, the Lord wasn't just limited to the land. This is a powerful statement. All of heaven is mine and all of the earth is mine. Now, i got to read Isaiah 66, 1 and 2 to you real quick here. This, this is powerful because this is what Stephen's quoting. And, you know, he's quoting all kinds of scripture out of, out of the Old Testament. Not once does Stephen ask for a scribe. Oh, can you get me the scribe of Isaiah? I want to read you something. Man, this stuff is just coming out of his mouth. Heaven, Isaiah 66, 1 and 2 where Isaiah prophesied heaven regarding God. Heaven is my, is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made. Like, what are you going to make me? I've, I've made it all. For all those things I... Um, for all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Oh, they lost sight. God, forgive me for thinking that, that I've got some significant part to play in all this. Uh, really, I mean, uh, apart from giving a, a great commission to go make God known and to live my life for Christ, uh, I, you know, uh, everything is his. For all those things God's hand made, and all those things that exist, says the Lord, I made them. But this is the one I'm going to look on. The one has, that has a contrite spirit and has hidden, really, has hidden my word in their heart. And these men hadn't done that. Back to Acts. Man, they know. Stephen's reminder, the people of Israel at this time missed the point of the temple. They believed that the temple was God's dwelling place on earth. Yes, it was a, it was a place that was meant for a, to be a place of worship and a house of prayer. But it wasn't God's home. Now, I want to move a little fast. I want you to, because there's some significant stuff here. Uh, look at 7, 35 through 43. Um, first, uh, this Moses, whom they rejected, right? But 
Stephen is pointing out that their DNA is sinful. As he, as he brings up the patriarchs, he's saying, your DNA, you think you're all that, your DNA is sinful. You've got a DNA that's built into you to, to reject God, just like you and I do. Thirty-five, right? He's saying, your father's rejected Moses, the man you are accusing me of blaspheming. He's, he's, he's dropping the bomb. You're accusing me of the very same thing that your forefathers, the patriarchs, did. In fact, the very thing you're doing now because you're not obedient to the law of Moses. Oh. Don't you hate it when somebody just like, the finger you're pointing at them, they just turn it around, point it right here. Ah! That's really what's happening here. Stephen is telling this council, you are all just like your fathers. They rejected Moses. They rejected Moses. He reminds them all through the wilderness, they wanted to go back to Egypt. How many times did they want to kill Moses? Moses couldn't do enough signs and wonders for a rejecting heart. God can't do enough signs and wonders if your heart is bent on rejecting him. Really, they're getting, hey, God sent his son, and you refused him too. And they're still refusing God's son. Their deliverer. Jesus came to the nation of Israel and to the Jews first. Think about that as a Gentile for a minute outside of the nation of Israel. Don't you ever think that you're special? You're prone, your sinful nature is prone to reject God just like the nation of Israel is. They rejected, and, and, and this is the thing, so and I want to jump back here. Stephen's also making a point with Moses They rejected him the first time, you know, he, but the second time he came in the power of God, right, they received him. For the nation of Israel, they're in a state of rejecting. The first time Jesus came, they rejected him. The second time he comes, they're going to receive him. God's not done with Israel. Zechariah 12.10, and I will pour out. I will pour on the house of David, that's the nation of Israel, and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. And then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, now this is post-crucifying Jesus. Whom they pierced, yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his, his only son and grieve him as one who grieves for the firstborn. God will awaken the rejecting dead heart of the nation of Israel. Verses 36 through 37, just as Moses did many signs and miracles delivering the nation of Israel uh, from Egypt, Moses also did many signs in the wilderness for 40 years. Stephen is reminding them of Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19. If you're a note taker, write it down, go back and read it. Stephen is telling them that this prophet has come, Jesus Christ, and you rejected him. He is the prophet of Deuteronomy 18, 50, 15 through 19. And after all, didn't Jesus say in John 14, 8 through 10, as he was speaking to Philip, he said, Lord, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. And it's sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Philip, have I been with you so long, yet you have not known me? Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. You, do you get that? Jesus was the perfect representation, perfect reflection of God the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Jesus is saying, if you've looked at me, you've looked right into the eyes of the Creator, the Father. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? 
The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the work. He's bringing about some serious conviction. Verses 38 through 39. The word here, congregation, literally means called out ones. And God had called the nation of Israel out of Egypt and was in the midst of them while they wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. I mean, how many illustrations? You have the bread of life in the manna. You have a, a, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, right? I mean, we could just go through all these illustrations of, uh, and then God eventually gives them the tabernacle of meeting and he's gathered a leader and, and God's meeting with them and, and it's evident on his face that he's been with God and All of that. But Stephen's reminding them their fathers didn't obey the word of God. They constantly wanted to turn back to sin, to slavery, away from freedom of following God and his word. As we look down at 40 through 43, here Stephen quotes the prophet Amos in 5, 25 through 27. These are pretty powerful words. Look them up. I don't want to waste your time. Uh, you look them up. He points out, uh, seen in, in the fact that they had Aaron make for themselves an idol, which turned them away from worshiping their God who loves them and, and had delivered them. You see, they were to have no other gods before them. And Babylon would be their judgment. In 44 through 50, after Solomon had finished building the temple, this is said. He said this in 2 Chronicles 6, 18. But will God indeed dwell with men on earth? This is the guy that he's, 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 he's blessing. He is... Um, uh, 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 um, the, the, the temple's done. Um, he's um, dedicating the temple here. And he says, but will God indeed dwell with men on earth? What, what is this? He understood Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. What is this to God? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. Temple couldn't, God couldn't be limited to the temple, and Solomon knew it. Now, Stephen has called their, to their remembrance passages from Isaiah, Amos, Deuteronomy, and Zechariah. And again, not one time did he crawl, call for a scroll. He just had the word of God in his heart. And this is what these men couldn't handle the truth. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> okay, Tom Cruise. <clears throat> and then 51 through 53, he nails them. You know, there's got to be a closing to every sermon. And this one, he closes out not by saying, Jesus just loves you and he wants the best for your life and everything's good. You know, just send me all your money. He says, you bunch of stiff-necked losers. Y'all going to hell, every last one of you. You know, and this is like, what? You know, so uh, he just goes nuts. Now, that word stiff-necked means stubborn and headstrong. And he calls them uncircumcised in heart and ears. Now, <laughs> again, the whole thing of circumcision had become like idolatry too. Right, circumcised the eighth day of the stock or whatever. You know, I go to First Baptist and I used to go to Second, but now I came back to First Baptist because that's where I was baptized when I was seven months old. So, <laughs> uncircumcised of heart and ears. You see, their religious attitude had just crippled them spiritually, and Stephen's calling them out. And this reminds us that God desires to cut away that which is in the way. It's your hard heart and your stopped up ears. 
That's what's in the way. There's an opportunity here for these men to name a prophet that did obey God's word, and they can't. In fact, Hebrews tells us the outcome of the prophets, that they stoned them, imprisoned them. In fact, the prophet Isaiah was cut in half. Did you know that? I know. The greatest Old Testament book. The very prophet he's quoting. Again, no one likes it when you call them a lying, cheating, betraying murder to their face, especially when they're religious and they think they're right. Stephen's reminding them that they're guilty before God. He's saying, look, God gave you divine law from himself. You rejected it. He sent his son, and you rejected and killed him. As we wrap up 54 through 60, these men were cut to the heart. And that doesn't mean that they were convicted by Stephen's words. In 56, these last dying words of Stephen are significant. First, they should remind us of the words of Jesus in Mark 14, 61 through 65, because they're just alike. Listen to this. Jesus, but he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. And then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him, to beat him, and to say to him, prophesy. And the officers of the temple struck him with the palm of their hands. Interesting. Interesting. They all stopped their, they, they, they plugged their ears, they ran at him with one accord, they cast him out. Look it. And they stoned Stephen, and as they were, he was calling on God. The term son of man, here in these very last verses, is the last time in scripture that it's used. And it is the only time in the gospels and acts when it is not spoken by Jesus himself. Stephen had the right words on his lips as he was being stoned to death. The term son of man comes from Daniel 7, 13 through 14 and Psalm 110 verse one, with the emphasis being on the supreme rule of the Messiah, the son of man. That the Son of Man won't be just another Jewish leader, but the Savior of the world. Notice that between uh, uh, the Gospels and Stephen's account, there's similarities, right? Jesus said, I, I'm going to the right hand of the Father. Stephen sees him at the right hand of the Father. <laughs> you know, you, 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 the problem with many of these, I saw Jesus books, right, is that they're not biblical, Stephen's account of literally seeing God, receiving him, is biblical because Jesus is in his proper place at the right hand. Power, speaks of power, position, and acceptance. He kneeled down. He cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, first off, I want to understand something. Do you, understand, you and I to understand something that, that all of this that he said, there was no hatred in his heart, but grace. Right? There might be a tone. At some point, he might have been pointing a finger and stomping a foot like a Southern Baptist. I don't know. But what I do know in the end was that grace is revealed here at the end. Not only was he seeing Jesus, receiving to himself, but he had the heart of Jesus. 
His heart had been changed and transformed. This idea that he fell asleep, right? The, the, the body sleeps, the soul goes on to be with the Lord. But God received him. And I think that we, we need to understand that, that as we look through the lens of Scripture, that things are going to get hard when, as things get great. They always do. Because, because as things look like they're really doing great, if it doesn't get hard, then I, sometimes I wonder where God's in it. If it's just all a nice slippery slope, like going down a slide, wind in my hair, right? Everything's great. I'm going, you know, I don't think God's in this direction of my life. It looks like things are shaking and baking, that life's going great, my marriage is good, this is good, job's good, finances are good, everything's good, couldn't be any better. My friend, look for God to shake you up. They both have to go together. You know that, right? Blessings and trials, they, they, they go hand in hand. Sometimes the trial is part of the blessing. Sometimes the persecution, God's in, right? That, that's, that's the thing. We'll notice that now Saul of Tarsus in chapter 8, just after this, I mean, obviously he wasn't transformed either. He's there holding the clothes. He's a part of this, you know, synagogue of the freedmen. He's just, all it does is make him, they killed Stephen, and man, he's on a, he's on a like a violent high. The next chapter, he's going after everybody. Men, women, children, get them all. Put them all in prison. Let's go after them all. And what happens to the church? Like embers, it scatters, it goes everywhere. Now the gospel, it's not just limited to Jerusalem. Now it goes out. It goes out. Out to the whole world. It just starts spreading out. The apostles and these disciples, all these thousands that are getting saved in Jerusalem just go, right? Now you've got little fires all over that are turning into big fires. Sometimes I think that we need to readjust our thinking. I mean, I'm proud of Stephen here. I'm super proud of Stephen. But, but I, I need to go, okay, so things are good, right? Okay. But things aren't so good. Embrace the struggle. Embrace it. Allow it to turn you to God and to see God's hand in, in your life, in every area of your life. If it's health, man, you fall on your face. I had the privilege of uh, being here by myself till midnight Friday night, finishing up the stage. Not because there wasn't people that would help, just because I didn't call nobody. Because I was in my, I was in my sweet zone, right? And uh, I only made one bad cut. It was right here, and it was right about midnight. So I puttied that up, and I'll paint that, and you will never see it. <laughs> yes, you will. But it was right here that I knelt down on that step, and I fell on the stage, and I started weeping. Because, God, you're moving you're blessing, you're, you're working in so many people's lives and you're stretching me out. But at the same time, there's this horrible struggle and a big part of it, I'm, I'm like confessing to God, God, I have no idea how this is all gonna get done. <laughs> I'm just, I'm like, I, I don't, God, I have no idea, you know? But I know you're doing it and I don't know how you're gonna do it, you know? And so, so this is what I heard. Stay focused on me, not the work, right? Not the, not the patriarchs and, and on the word, on me and what I'm doing, you know? Don't make anything an idol. Don't make anything an idol. Don't make anything an idol. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word this morning. Um... I know there are many here that are feeling persecuted or experiencing trials and difficulties, hard times in one way or another. 
But you are the living God, and you're the God of those trials, and you're the God of the struggle, and you're the God of the persecution. Nothing, nothing gets to you without going through the Father first. Everything is Father filtered. And so like with Stephen, you can proclaim the truth, you can live in the truth, you can abide in the truth, knowing that the truth sets you free. You don't need to be afraid. You can speak the truth. You can stand regardless of what happens to you because your life is in Christ. It's not your own. And this morning, if, if you're holding on to your own life and your own stuff and this world, you need to surrender it back to God. You can't hold on to anything here. Just embrace what God's doing. Walk in obedience. Surrender to the Lord. As he said, today is the day of salvation. Every day. Walk in the grace of Jesus Christ. This morning, if you need prayer during this song, come forward. Myself and Doug would love to pray with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. All my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing.
fit for a kid except for a heart singing hallelujah hallelujah you guys are awesome wow well um I hope to see most of you back Wednesday night. We'll make room for everybody. It's an important night. And, uh, and so with that said, um, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. Let's go with God, church. God bless you guys.